Philippine Sciences Prize in Food and Agricultural Sciences, which is an extremely high honor. Christina was also awarded the 2022 Penn State President's Award for Excellence in Academic Integration. Christina earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology from McGill University and her master's and doctoral degrees from Harvard University. On her leadership, the Center for Pollination Research is the premier US academic facility focusing on research, education, outreach, and policy issues for pollinators. It includes members from nine colleges across Penn State and uses an integrative approach from genes to spatial ecology to support the health of bee populations. As an entomologist myself, I'm really looking forward to Christina's presentation day and catching up on some of the latest. So, all right, off to you, Christina. Hey, thank you, Dean Rash, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for organizing this and all of you who are um, listening in. So let me see if I can share my screen. Okay, that looks okay. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover a lot of different topics today, but one thing that I wanted to start out with is that uh, we have a new website for our Center for Pollinator Research. So if you or when you get bored listening to me talk at you through Zoom and you need to do something else, I encourage you to check out this website. Um, we've uh, reorganized things and restructured things to make it really easy to find um, a lot of the, the material that I'll be talking about today, including information about our pollinators, how to design your gardens and landscapes for pollinators, um, the research that we do, also our, our uh, collaboration with the Penn State Center for Science in the schools, um, where we're developing classroom materials. And then we also have this really great resource library that I'll talk about in a little more detail. And I really wanna thank Heather Franz and Harlan Patch and Kristen Bittner, um, who were instrumental in getting this website together. And also there was funding that we received from the Pennsylvania Ag Resource Center um, to, to build this. So please um, check it out. And, uh, and I'll refer back to this a couple of times as we talk today. So I always like to check, you know, what people's knowledge of pollinators and pollination is. It's a little bit hard to do in a, in a Zoom meeting, but, um, but if you think about pollination, you know, what, what does that mean to you? I'm not sure if people are putting things in the chat. Oh, no. Um, so Pollination, as one of my friends described it, is the movement of the daddy parts of the flower to the mommy parts of the flower to make baby plants, right? So it's basically the movement of the pollen from the anthers to the stigma, and that's necessary for setting seed and making fruit. Um, and there are some plants that use wind, um, others, a few use water to spread their pollen, but 80% of flowering plant species benefit from animals moving the pollen around. And so um, those, uh, in terms of which animals those are, it's pretty diverse. It's insects, um, birds, uh, mammals in some cases, but bees are really the best pollinators because they have evolved to collect the pollen and bring it back to their nest to feed to their babies, right? So the pollen is a protein and fat source for them. And so they um, have all of these adaptations to be able to collect a lot of pollen and move it around. So they're very fuzzy, their hairs help them pick up pollen. They have certain behaviors like buzz pollination to release the pollen from the anthers. And then some bees like this honeybee have pollen baskets, right? So they're, um, they end up being the most um, efficient and effective pollinators in many cases. Okay, so why do we care about pollination? So 80% um, of, of flowering plants benefit from pollinators and that translates into about three quarters of our major food crops that um, also benefit from pollinators and have higher yield if there's pollinators around. So these are things that you would expect like um, your fruits, and vegetables and your nut crops like almonds. It's also things where you need pollination to make seed, right? So like in the case of carrots or broccoli, it's very essential things like our coffee. Um, and then some things that you might not expect. So how is cheese pollinated? Well, um, our dairy cattle will eat alfalfa, which requires pollination to set seed. Um, wood, this is a picture of our uh, black cherry wood, which is really an important timber um, source for our industry here in Pennsylvania, and uh, that also requires pollination, and then also things like cotton benefit from pollinators. And so we did an analysis with colleagues at University of Pittsburgh, and we found that about $34 billion of um, the U.S. agricultural economy is, is driven by pollinators. And then in Pennsylvania, this translates into about $250 million 
dollars um, into our agricultural industries coming from these different crops that I've shown here. And these numbers are a little bit older. It's based on the last time there was a, a census done of, of US agriculture. So these are, of course, going to be higher now. Uh, the important thing also to remember is that we need to have a lot of different kinds of pollinator species. So we think often about honeybees primarily, um, but we have a, a number of different um, bees and other species that contribute to our agricultural systems. So squash bees are important for pollinating cucurbit crops. Flies are the second most important pollinators after bees um, for agricultural crops. This is a, an Osmia mason bee. So these are one of our early spring flying bees and uh, they're important for orchard pollination. And if, if you uh, like tequila, it is uh, coming from agave, which is bat pollinated. So the next time you have a cocktail, be sure to thank your friendly pollinating bats for that. Okay, so where do bees live? Um, so about 70% of our bee species actually live underground. So they, they dig tunnels underground and they make their nests underground. And then 30% of bees live in above ground nests. And these could be um, in, in stems that you would find uh, in the pithy stems of shrubs or in, in dead trees. Um, and then others will also live in, uh, in cavities um, such as in, in holes of, of old trees. And so uh, you know, this is sort of what it looks like if you actually look at the nest. So the ground nesters would be things like our sweat bees, cellophane bees, squash bees. The stem and hole nesters would be our carpenter bees, our orchard bees, leaf cutting bees, and then cavity nesters, of course, are honey bees and bumblebees. And when we think about what do the bees need in their habitat to be able to survive, so obviously they need a place to build their nest. Um, but then they also have to collect food, which again, pollen and, and nectar are their primary food sources. And then um, they also need to collect things to build their nests with. So leaf cutting bees would be collecting pieces of leaves, for example, mason bees would be collecting mud. So what's happening with our pollinators? So I'm sure you've all heard about pollinator declines and, uh, and these are being caused by multiple interacting factors. Um, so in Pennsylvania, beekeepers report about 40 to 50% of their colonies die each winter. And this is coming from a survey that they've been doing for several years now. Um, when we look at bumblebees, which are one of the more um, charismatic wild bee species, and so they're, they're, uh, they've been well studied, 50% of the bumblebee species in the US are showing declines. And there's one local bee species, the um, rusty patch bumblebee that's on the endangered list. I like to show this picture of the distribution of Bombus pennsylvanicus, because I think this should be our, our state bee. And so in uh, gray, you see its historic distribution. So it was really all over the Eastern US. And then these circles are where researchers went to sample bumblebees. And if, um, if the circle is colored in with orange, that's where they actually found Bombus pennsylvanicus. So you can see that they basically did not find it um, on, the, on the eastern part of the US in nor in Pennsylvania. And so now it's really only found in sort of the Midwest region, right? So this is a, an example of a really strong range contraction. And then for monarch butterflies, their populations have declined by about 80% uh, over the last 20 years. So these declines are consistent with declines that we've been seeing with insect populations more broadly. Um, and, and so again, honeybees and uh, wild bees have been really well studied because they're so charismatic. But as we start looking into these other species, we're also finding these declines. So what is causing these declines? So um, one of the major causes is habitat uh, degradation and loss and fragmentation, right? So if you think about a very highly agricultural area or a very urbanized area, there's really no place for bees to nest and nothing for them to eat. Um, there's also concerns about insecticides. Uh, bees get sick just like we do, so they have viruses and parasites. And then climate change, of course, will cause extreme weather, which will be problematic for bees. Um, but it also causes changes in, in seasonal weather patterns that can um, affect the plants that the bees need as well, right? So if there's drought conditions, the plants are not going to be able to produce as many flowers and there won't be as many resources for the bees. The good thing is in Pennsylvania, we're actually in a really 
good position with the way our landscape is structured and the way our agricultural systems are structured. So we have a very diverse cropping system, um, one of the most diverse in the country. And so that means a lot of different kinds of foods for bees and a lot of different kinds of fields. Our fields are relatively small, and that means that um, they're surrounded by natural habitat uh, in, in very close proximity that the bees can live in and then move into those fields. And so David Binger, who's a professor in our Department of Entomology and at the Penn State Fruit Research and Extension Center, has been doing work on pollinators in fruit orchards for many years. And he's found that there are about 235 bee species that he can find in these orchards. And more than 50 of these were actually visiting the flowers of apple and cherry trees, right? So there's a lot of, of wild pollinators that are, that are present in these orchards and providing pollination services. Uh, Shelby Fleischer, who's an emeritus faculty member in our entomology department, and Carly McGrady, who's a former grad student, looked at pollination services in um, pumpkins, and what they found was similar. There are 37 different kinds of wild bee species visiting pumpkins, and they're providing 15 times the pollination needed to be able to set fruit in this system. So again, a lot of pollinators. Uh, Shelby Kilpatrick, who is a former grad student in entomology, and Professor Margarita Lopez Uribe developed a checklist of bees in Pennsylvania, and they found 437 wild bee species that are native to Pennsylvania. So we have, we have a lot of bees that we can um, work with. And Margarita has been leading a team of, of people to develop the Pennsylvania Bee Monitoring Program, which has a goal of training volunteers to um, do research grade monitoring and collections. And so, so far 40 master gardeners have been trained uh, and they're sampling from across the state and um, collecting bees and then putting these into a centralized collection, which is then digitized and shared. And so this allows us to better understand the distribution of these bees um, and, and learn more about them, but also better identify um, declines as they might happen. And so, so far they've collected over 6,000 bees and they've identified 190 species of bees from this. So one of the, the best and most fun ways to help bees is of course to um, increase the plantings of flowering plants in your gardens or in your farms or in your urban areas. And so there's always sort of this perennial question of what are the best plants for pollinators? And when we look at flowering plants, there's a lot of um, variation in them, right? So they come in different shapes, they come in different colors, they have different scents. Um, and people have been able to match these different characteristics to different kinds of pollinators that visit them. So flies like shallow flowers that are usually white and don't necessarily smell floral, but maybe a little more stinky. Um, hummingbirds and bumblebees like flowers that have deep corollas and they can access those um, because they're large enough to get in there. Um, but when we sort of think about this diversity of plants, really what is important for the bees and for the other pollinators is the kind of resources that these plants are providing. So the nectar and the pollen. So is there enough of it and is it of um, enough nutritional quality? So I like to show this picture. This is showing um, honey samples that uh, Kate Anton, our, our beekeeper in the Center for Pollinary Research has collected, and then also the pollen samples. And you can see that they vary greatly in their color. And so that um, they also vary in terms of their nutritional quality as well. So how do we pick the best plants um, for bees and other pollinators? So there's three different ways you can do this, which we've been doing in our center, and I'll sort of describe some of these in more detail. So one is to look at the nutritional quality of the pollen and the nectar. So how much sugar does it have? Um, what is the concentration of the protein and the lipids? Um, and then try to match those with the nutritional requirements of a particular pollinator species. The other thing is to, to pick plants um, that we're interested in and then study them in the field and see who comes, comes to those plants and which, ones, um, which plants attract the greatest abundance and diversity of pollinators. The other thing that we can do is we can collect the pollen or the nectar that the bees are bringing back and we can do um, DNA metabarcoding on this to identify the, the plants that the bees have been collecting um, these resources from. So for the, for the first, um, version of this. So this is work that was done by Anthony Vaudeau and he was a graduate student in entomology. He's now a research scientist at the U.S. Forest Service. And he collected pollen with collaborators from 82 different plant species and he analyzed the proteins and the lipids 
um, of those pollens and, and, uh, and then calculated the protein lipid ratio, which some of our studies have been showing is very important um, for, for bee nutrition. And you can see there's a really broad range of protein lipid ratios. And when you look at the pollen that different bee species, so these are bumblebees, these are mason bees, and these are honeybees, are bringing back, they're falling along this range, right? So that suggests that maybe if we pick plants that have the right ratio, um, that will be better for the bees. Um, and so that's a, an area that we've been pursuing and looking at in more detail. I will say that the bees are really good at mixing pollen from different plant species. And so they don't necessarily have to have exactly the right pollen um, blend. Uh, they can kind of create it themselves. The other thing we can do is put out plants that we're interested in and then uh, monitor visitation patterns. And so this is what Emily Erickson did when she was a graduate student in entomology. She's now a postdoc at UC Davis. And she looked at 25 perennial and 25 annual ornamental plant species and cultivars and looked uh, at these to identify which um, species and which cultivars were the most attractive. And so one example from her, her study is that when she got all of this data, she identified the plants that were the most attractive and the ones that were the least attractive, and then looked to see what would happen if you made a garden with the six most attractive species and cultivars and the six least, right? And so for example, this is an Agastache cultivar, Blue Fortune, which is very attractive, and another Agastache cultivar, Summer Glow, that's less attractive, right? So it's just different cultivars um, from these same species. And if you use the high attraction six species, you can attract 80 different bee species, including some that are um, pollen specialists and some that are very rare in the landscape. If you use the uh, low attraction plants, you only get 20 bee species. And some of these are the ones that um, are very commonly found in the landscape. So like honeybees um, and the common Eastern bumblebee. So just by selecting your plants carefully, you can get a really different kind of pollinator garden with the same number of plants. So the, the third strategy that I was telling you about is, is collecting the pollen that the bees are bringing back to their nest and then using DNA metabarcoding to ask what are the bees foraging on across the entire landscape. And this is work um, that was done by Doug Sponser when he was a postdoc here. He's now um, a postdoc at University of Würzburg and he collaborated with Don Shump who is a beekeeper in Philadelphia. And so Doug collected pollen off of the apiaries that Don was maintaining throughout Philadelphia and then did this um, DNA metabarcoding to see what the bees were bringing back at different times in the growing season. And what he found was that in the spring, they were collecting pollen from maples, oaks, and willows, so these spring blooming trees. In the summer, they switched to more shrubby things like crepe myrtle and Japanese pagoda tree. And then late summer and fall, they were collecting off of woody vines. So um, I, I'm sure some of you at least have heard about this No Mo May movement, um, which is something that was started by a, a nonprofit company or nonprofit group in the UK. And the idea is basically, you know, don't bother mowing your lawn, let the, the lawn weeds flower, um, and then you can relax and the bees can get some food, right? So it sounds great. Um, but as, as scientists, we always have to sort of look at these things and try to see um, how, how much, um, you know, what we hope is happening is really happening. And so we had been collecting pollen from our honeybee hives um, just because we were interested in seeing what they were foraging on in early spring. And um, so we had the stash of pollen that we had collected um, from 2021 and we analyzed it using our DNA metabarcoding. And what we found was that in April to May, they were going to trees and shrubs. So this was maple, oak, and willow and then um, fruit trees in early April as well. In early June, for about a one week period, um, they were collecting uh, primarily from these lawn flowering weeds, many of which are not native weeds. Um, and some of these like crown vetch are things that you don't necessarily want to um, encourage. And then they transitioned over to these um, shrubby plants and perennial plants. So um, this, uh, this is sort of advertisement for our, our uh, honey and pollen diagnostics lab that we're developing. And so if you are a beekeeper and you want to understand what, what, um, what plants your bees are foraging on, um, we are able to analyze that for you. And so this is uh, Dr. Michelle Mansfield who's leading this, so you can contact her. So, um, so overall what this suggests is that not mowing your lawn in May is probably not really helping the bees in Pennsylvania at all. 
Um, maybe not mowing it for a little bit in June might be helpful, um, but then there's also concerns about tick populations, right? So what could you do instead of um, not mowing your lawn? You could actually plant a lot of these native plants um, that do flower in the spring. So this is a list of, of some of these, um, and I'm sure we can provide them for you if you need them. But again, there's a lot of um, options for beautiful spring flowering plants. And I really encourage people to start thinking about flowering trees as well, because that's a great way to get a lot of flowers um, in, in a, a relatively small place to help, help your bees. Okay, so what things have we learned? So, um, so you want to have a diversity of plants that are coming from different um, families, genera, and species. Remember the trees and the shrubs. And then also it's important to know that not all flowering plants actually provide resources. So calorie pear, for example, does not provide resources. Um, ideally, you'd be focusing on um, native species, but ornamentals and exotics can be valuable too, um, especially if they're sort of working with the aesthetics of your garden. Okay. So what about garden design? So we talked about the specific kinds of plants that you can put in your garden, but, um, but the way that you structure your garden can also be really important for supporting pollinators. So uh, Emily Erickson, when she was doing her, her research, was trying to understand what were the traits that were most um, important for attracting different pollinator species. And what she found was that having um, large floral areas, so big clumps of flowers, was important for getting a lot of things. Um, and then also having tall flowers was important. So these, you know, they can't see that well. They're usually um, orienting themselves according to smell. So having big, tall um, clumps of flowers are very attractive to them. In a study that was done in the UK, researchers looked at pollinators that were in different kinds of urban um, land use categories, right? What they found was that the most pollinators were in allotments, which are basically like our community um, garden plots, right? And more so than what you would find in a home garden or even in natural areas. And the reason for this is that when you have this small piece of land that you're trying to grow your, uh, your home garden, your home um, crop garden off of, you plant a lot of things and you plant a lot of diverse things. And so, um, so these are just really chock full of different kinds of flowering plants and they're very attractive to the bees. The other thing to remember is that you need to have um, flowers that bloom throughout the season. So we have some bees like our mason bees that are um, flying in the early spring and then other ones like leaf cutting bees that have come out in the middle of the summer and then bumblebees or honeybees that are present really all throughout the growing season. So you want to try to plant for the entire growing season. So adding on to our list of things and so we have to consider a season long diversity and abundance of flowering plants. All right, so where can you learn more? I have a website for you. So you should go to our website um, and we have uh, landscaping for pollinators. And if you open this up, you can get information about what to plant, how to develop um, habitat for solitary bees. And then very importantly, you can get information about the pollinator habitat certification program that the master gardeners have developed. And this is a great program. It really walks you through step-by-step -step of what you need to do in order to develop um, a really uh, effective pollinator garden and habitat that can support a diversity of pollinators. And there's been over 1,100 gardens that have been certified in Pennsylvania. Um, and Connie Schmotzer is the lead on that. You can also come to the Center County Master Gardener Plant Sale, which is happening on Saturday. And there will be talks at the Pasto Agricultural Museum from Dr. Patch and uh, Heather Franz on different kinds of plants for bees, flies, and hummingbirds. And there's also um, some of these plants will be available for sale as well. And then there's the Solitary Bee Hotel Workshop, which is happening on uh, May 26th. The other place to go and get inspired is going to the, um, the Arboretum's Pollinator and Bird Garden. So this is a four acre garden. Um, it was really, it's really the only garden that was developed from scientific and ecological principles. So a lot of the research that we've been doing at the Center for Pollinator Research was used to uh, design this garden. And it's really quite inspiring and beautiful. And you can see the um, honeybee observation hive, which is in this pavilion here. And then you can also visit the solitary bee uh, hotels as well. And um, if you would like more of a guided tour of this, we are hosting the Pollination Celebration on June 24th, um, and there will be a showing of Pollinators the Musical, which is developed by our Master Gardeners, and it is really quite awesome, so it's not to be missed. 
Okay, so um, when you think about your garden, it's usually a, a relatively small space, right? And it's embedded in a much larger landscape. So um, in this view from of Adams County, you know, if we have a honeybee colony in the middle here, the bees can actually forage across this entire area, right? So how do you know what um, your landscape is providing for bees in this area? So we wanted to develop a, a tool, um, which we call Beescape, to help people better explore and understand their landscapes. And um, the goal was to take these land use categories and convert them into indices that tell people about what the floral resources are available in their region, if there's nesting habitat available, what the overall toxic load of applied insecticides are, and soon we will also be adding the economic value of pollination services. And these indices were developed um, by these people who are collaborators on this Beescape project. So if you go to our Center for Pollinator Research website, you can go to the Beescape page and explore. Um, I will say that this is uh, the older version of this Beescape tool, and we're developing a new version, which I will preview for you today. Um, and we're hoping that we'll have the new version up in um, about two weeks. And so this is developed in collaboration with the Penn State Institute for Computational and Data Sciences um, and Penn State uh, Geography, and then also the USDA ARS. So uh, in the new version of Beescape, when you go in, you can um, search for your site. So I did a search for State College. And so then you pull up the map and you can switch it between a satellite or a street view. And um, then you have the option to draw an, uh, the area that you're interested in or drop a circle. Um, so in this case, I drew um, this sort of I don't know what shape this is, <laughs> just look at the area here. Um, and then as you do that, the program will call up what the land use categories are in this area that you've, that you've um, drawn, right? So in this case, we're in State College, it's mostly developed land, and then you transition into corn and uh, pasture and hay, and then you go into forest. Uh, on the side here, you can get these um, habitat quality scores, right? So you can see Example for uh, nesting habitat, this is relatively low. Spring floral resources, it's, it's lower than the average of what we get. Summer floral resources are pretty good, and then it drops again in the fall, and then we have relatively high insecticide use, right? So this is, um, again, all coming from the surrounding landscape. So if we had more forest in here, we would have more floral resources in the spring because of all those flowering trees, and we'd have more nesting habitat. Um, this site also will give you the, uh, the, the temperature and the precipitation. So you can see in the blue is the 10-year um, normals. This is across the months, which I cut off down here. And then in orange, it tells you what the current year has been. So if you're like me and you can't remember if you're in a drought or not, you can refer to Beescape and, uh, and get that information. The other thing is that you see these little dots here, right? So that is data that's being pulled in from iNaturalist. Um, and so for the, the flowering plants and the pollinators that have been observed in the area. So in this case, you can click on the dot and see that somebody has seen Northern Spice, spice Bush. Um, and this will be sort of for around the time, um, this will be calibrated to, to the time that you're going into Beescape. So you can see what's actually blooming and what's present at the time. Um, that you're looking at it. And so if you need to improve your floral resources, this can give you some ideas for how to, how to do that. Okay, so your landscape context is important. So maybe try to convince your neighbors to also create pollinator habitat. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about pollinator habitat, which is important for, um, for wild bees and also for honeybees, of course, since they, they use the flowers um, that we're planting in these, these areas. But honeybees, of course, are managed, and so they have um, some different characteristics. So I'm going to switch over now to talking a little bit more about honeybees. So our beekeepers in Pennsylvania are awesome, and they have been collecting data on the uh, winter losses that they've been experiencing for, I think, over 15 years now. So we partnered with them um, a couple of years ago to add some questions to their survey that we could then use uh, to better understand the drivers of colony losses in Pennsylvania over the winter months. And so we um, recently analyzed the data that was available from 2017 to 2012. Um, this is looking at the number of colonies that are alive in November, um, and then how many are alive the following spring. And this uh, data that I'm showing you will be is uh, has been um, analyzed by Darcy Gray, who's a master's student in our ecology program, and then also in collaboration with Sarah Gosling, Melanie Kammerer from the USDA ARS. 
Um, so we have beekeepers from across the state reporting. Um, we had over 3,000 survey responses uh, representing nearly 24,000 colonies. And so what did we find? So we found that the average loss was about 50%. Um, and in uh, the best year, it was 43%. The worst year was 55% loss. Um, honeybees have a parasitic mite called Varroa. And treating for Varroa is really important to ensuring winter survival. So beekeepers that treated for Varroa had much higher survival than beekeepers who did not treat for Varroa. There's multiple kinds of treatments that you can use. And so what we found was that beekeepers that used one kind of treatment um, had a higher survival, but if they used two kinds of treatments, it was even better, right? So this is sort of the integrated pest management approach where you use multiple ways to, to manage your pests. Um, when we looked at the different kinds of chemicals that people use, so there are these soft chemicals versus uh, more hard insecticides, there was no difference in um, terms of survival. Uh, and then this is sort of the breakdown of the different kinds of things. So formic acid, thymol, and oxalic acid would be sort of soft organic chemicals, and then amitraz as a hard. And you can see that um, survival rates were about the same. There was a question that was submitted about uh, when should you apply oxalic acid and you should apply it when there's no brood, um, and but it can be used um, anytime throughout the year, but it's most effective when there's no brood. So um, when we looked at what land use and weather factors were driving winter survival, um, what we found was that if there's better summer forage, right, so more plants in the summer, the colony survival was better. Um, and survival was better if the temperature and the rain in the summer were intermediate, right? So if it's raining too much, they can't forage. If it's not raining enough, there's probably um, not too many flowering plants. When we mapped out the survival for um, colonies that were treated with single treatments versus multiple treatments, what you can see is that um, colonies with single treatments had areas in Pennsylvania where there is very low survival, right? Um, and on, on Overall, there's sort of average survival, but then if you have multiple treatments, there's, there's better survival across the whole state, right? So colonies with multiple treatments have higher survival across a broader range of weather conditions. So climate smart management for honeybees means uh, multiple treatments um, to control varroa. All right, so where can you learn more? You can go to our website. Um, so we have a becoming a beekeeper section of our website that you can go to to get basic information. Um, we also have a resource library that you can go to um, and search for information on beekeeping, um, honeybees, and you can do this in English and Spanish. Um, and then there's a number of guides that, that you'll um, be able to pull up on different kinds of topics uh, related to beekeeping. Uh, Robin Underwood, who is our Penn State Education Educator in Apiculture, also runs a number of programs. So there's Beekeeping 101, which is an online course that you can take um, from the comfort of your own home. There's also Organic um, Honeybee Colony Management, the certification program um, through Penn State. Uh, there's EPIC, the Education about Production and Insemination of Queens, if you're um, considering developing your own queen stocks and doing um, genetics and breeding of, of bees. And there's also the Beekeeping Around the World webinar series, which I think just wrapped up and the videos from that are available through the extension site and there will be another one um, coming this fall. All right, so where can you learn more? Um, go to our website, it's got lots of information. Um, the Pollinator and Bird Garden at the Arboretum is of course a great place to go and explore. Uh, the Frost Entomological Museum is also has um, bees and, and other um, insects exhibited there. There's the Master Gardener Plant Sale, which is happening this weekend. The Solitary Bee Hotel Workshop at the Arboretum, which is happening on May 26. Um, we're running a, a short course with the Xerces Society on pollinary conservation. I think it's full right now, but you can check out the website and get on the waiting list. Um, we we're hosting the International Conference on Pollinator Biology, Health and Policy in early June. Um, and you're welcome to join for that. We're having people come from all over the world uh, to talk about uh, bee health and conservation and um, uh, policy issues. And pollination celebration is happening on June 24th. Um, and then if you are a K through 12 educator, you can join us for um, the Ag Seedlings Workshop, which is being um, run in, in uh, collaboration with the Center for Science and the Schools. And I think I gave, um, I gave Mary all those links. So hopefully we were able to share that with you. So with that, I think that's all I have. And I am happy to take any questions that you might have.
Christina, that was terrific. There are a number of links in the chat right now. Um, and, we, and we have some questions were submitted earlier. A couple of questions have already been answered by what you said. Actually, I, I thought it's a terrific offer in case anybody missed it, that you will test their honey and help identify the, the uh, plant. So that's terrific. Yes, yeah, no, we are excited about, about that um, service because it's not just a service for you, but uh, but we're hoping to compile all of the data that we get and better understand, you know, the distribution of flowering plants, both in space and time across Pennsylvania. So, so we're excited um, to help people learn more about their plants, and then we can also learn more about those plants and, and make better recommendations for people. Yeah, and while I'm at it, can you explain what the DNA meta barcoding is all meta about? <laughs> So, um, so it is a molecular technique. So basically, um, the pollen that bees collect, usually it's coming from multiple plant species. So even in a single foraging trip, the bees are collecting pollen from different kinds of plants. And, uh, and so there's different ways that you can analyze it. So um, you can take that pollen and stain it and spread it out on a microscope slide and look at the, the, um, the shape and the color and match it with a library of, of single source pollens and then try to um, from that, deduce what, what the pollens are. Or um, you can, what we do is we amplify um, pieces of the genome that are um, conserved enough that we can target that with certain um, DNA primers, but they're diverse enough that they vary between different plant genera and species. So we can amplify these little pieces of the genome, um, sequence them, and then compare them to a database and then be able to say what are, what are the plants that are present in that particular sample. So it's a, it's a, a much more efficient way of processing a lot of samples. So you use DNA techniques to make multiple copies from a few copies so you can really read these things. Fascinating exactly. stuff. Latest, latest molecular biology. Um, you mentioned that uh, no mo doesn't really work, but one of the questions was, what are the easiest ways to turn lawn in the community with a um, homeowners association into something better for pollinators, but still confirm to rules? Conform. Yeah, so um, so we we have actually um, related to that. We have been talking with uh, the municipality at, in in State College, the State College of Borough, to also talk about things that can be done um, in the borough to to help pollinators, right? And so one easy thing uh, to do is to have more flowering trees and shrubs, right? So that's always have permitted. And it's also something, you know, we have a lot of street trees. And so converting over into more um, pollinator supporting street trees is, is a really easy way um, to support pollinators. Um, there's also, of course, the gardens themselves, right? So, so managing those gardens or having managed gardens with um, pollinator plants can also, of course, so, you know, provide a lot of resources for pollinators. Um, and we've been discussing with the um, the borough about potentially allowing those gardens that will be over a certain height to get closer to um, to the the sidewalks, right? So that's another another straightforward thing to do. Um, there are uh, programs that are uh, making recommendations for lawn plants, like sort of short growing flowering plants that would still fit within um, sort of the lawn guidelines, but still flower and provide resources. And I believe Mary put a link. Um, to uh, one of the, the sites uh, that has been developing that. So in University of Minnesota, they've, um, they've really developed a research program that's been looking at that in, um, in more detail. So, um, so again, those are, would be things like clovers and, and such. Yeah, great. So um, one of the next questions to ask is, uh, should I tolerate carpenter, bee, carpenter bees living on my back porch? And we talked about this a little ahead of time. And uh, Christina's already um, written a really great um, uh, website about this, and it's the first one in the chat. But it's so it's not even if it's people have, even if you are willing to tolerate it, some people have got to do <laughs> something about carpenter bees boring into the wood and so forth. But it, you just need to go to that website and you can fill it in really well. Yeah, I think um, so, Mary, if you could drop that in the link again. So, Kate Anton um, and I wrote a couple of um, extension articles about this. So one is is about the common um, eastern carpenter bee, and is it a beneficial pollinator or you know a, a, a pest? Um, and then also, if you are finding bees or wasps uh, around your house, how do you deal with that? So I will say with um, with carpenter bees, they're really cool. They have very cool behaviors, um, and they're very interesting. But 
they can, you know, I, I speak from experience, like we have a, a wooden house and we have lots of carpenter bees that live in there. And uh, it's to the point that we have um, the parasites of the carpenter bees that come to visit, the woodpeckers come and visit. And so um, it, it might be too much to, to handle. So that um, link that Mary shared has a couple of suggestions for how to prevent them from, um, from making nests in your house, uh, maybe enticing them to go to a different area. And then um, if the problem gets too much, then there's also information about, you know, how to contact local pest, pesticide companies to help help with managing those populations. Not the outcome we want, but we do have to manage them sometimes. And sometimes uh, they get very robust, yeah. Yeah. So how is climate change affecting commercial pollinators for blueberries and other crops? Yeah, so climate, so it's interesting that when we, um, when we have been studying the factors that are causing mm -hmm population changes um, and, and declines in diversity, weather and climate end up being really important factors, right? And, um, and so, you know, the way that climate is affecting bees is it's either, um, it could be affecting them directly, right? So if it's um, too cold in the winter, or too hot in the summer, and there's really extremes, then it can be physiologically stressful for them. Uh, it could cause them to come out early um, before the flowering plants are coming out, right? And so then they don't have food available to them or they come out early, um, the flowering plants are there and there's a frost and it kills all the flowering plants and takes away their food. Um, or if there's a lot of rain in the summer, then they can't um, forage or if it's too dry, then the plants don't, don't flower. So there's a lot of potential issues um, with, with our wild pollinators matching up with our food crops. Uh, for a lot of our commercial crops, uh, the growers will bring in commercial, commercially raised bees, right? So um, honeybees or bumblebees or mason bees or leaf cutting bees that are, are reared somewhere else and then brought into the fields. And so that can, you know, it's not the ideal, like we would rather have it that there's enough native bees in the background um, to support those crops. But um, but those commercial pollinator services can can provide that that level of buffer. But this is something that we're looking at in more detail. So uh, Heather Grab, who is a new assistant professor in entomology who will be starting soon, um, is working with uh, Wyman's, which is a, a major is the major um, blueberry producer in in the U.S. And so we've been working with them to to look at microhabitat and microclimate effects on pollination services to better be able to understand you know how these sort of smaller scale um, weather and habitat effects might be, might be altering their yield and how we could potentially improve that either through managing the landscape or managing the pollinators. So um, another question was, are common pesticides or lawn care garden products negatively affecting pollinators? And if so, how and why? And one of the questions in the Q&A is, uh, is it increasingly important to engage farmers and all that? Yes. So, um, so when, when we think about pesticides, so I always like to point out, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of pesticides and the ways that they impact bees um, can vary, right? So insecticides, of course, are designed to kill insects. And so um, bees will be directly affected by those. Uh, herbicides, so um, herbicides that are like Roundup that's being used to control weeds um, in home gardens and then also in, in agricultural fields. Um, that, of course, is reducing the amount of flowers that the bees have available to them, and it seems to be one of the, the major reasons for um, milkweed declines and therefore monarch declines um, in, in the Midwest. Um, and then fungicides, which should, you wouldn't think would be problematic for bees, they actually synergize with some of the, um, well, they, they'll, they'll reduce the ability of the bees to detoxify other insecticides. So the fungicides themselves can also have issues. So, um, so pesticide use in general, um, the, the best strategy is this sort of integrated pest um, management strategy, right? Where you're um, only treating when you feel, when they're, you've reached an, an economic or damage threshold, right? And then you're um, using prevention or multiple treatments to try to control those pests. And if you have to use an insecticide, um, if you look at the label, it'll tell you what the toxicity is to bees and give suggestions for how to minimize um, the bees' contact with it. So spraying um, when the flowers are not blooming or after they've completed blooming or even spraying at night can, can reduce um, impacts on, on bees. And one of our faculty members you've already identified, David Bittinger, works a lot on this, trying to figure out how to uh, minimize in, uh, insecticidal effects 
Um, does beekeeping create excess pressure on native pollinators and how do we minimize that? Yeah, so um, so there's there's been increasing concern about beekeeping, especially in urban areas where you can have really high density of, of bee colonies um, in a sort of given area. And uh, and you know it's, it would make sense that that the more bees you have, the more flowers you need to be able to support those bees. And if you have a honeybee colony, you know that's fifty thousand bees, right? So it's it's a lot of bees. Um, so in terms of whether or not you see negative effects, I think it's it and the studies um, that have been coming out on this seem to be very sort of landscape context specific. So if you have enough flowers and you have enough resources, you're not going to have effects. So so my my sort of um, recommendation is just plant more flowers and you can you can help everyone, right? Um, there have been studies that have shown that that the viruses that honeybees have will spill over into wild bee populations. Um, the extent to which those viruses are negatively affecting those those native bee populations is unknown, but that's also a potential negative consequence. But again, if you have more flowers, then you can um, you can dilute that out and then help the bees be um, be have better immune systems. Um, but one thing I think that is important is that you know the the honey honey bees have beekeepers who are really really great advocates for them and for pollinators and and for um, supporting pollinators, including in, in urban areas. And so um, so I, I think it's a it's important to kind of work with work with beekeepers and with land managers to improve pollination services and increase awareness um, of bees and and um, and plants in these areas. I would say that if you're interested in helping bees, um, the easiest thing to do is to plant a pollinator garden. Um, the next easiest thing to do is to put out habitat for uh, wild bees, right? So like these solitary bee hotels. And if you're really committed to a lot of effort and a lot of work, that's when um, becoming a beekeeper in terms of honeybee, uh, keeping honeybees, um, it becomes more feasible. There are a lot of work, those honeybees. They, they, take, they take a lot of attention. They're very, um, they're very wonderful, but you have to uh, really work with them year round. Right. So you've already touched on this some about the disease threat to, to native bees by honeybees, but are there some kind of strategies can be used to reduce that contact and spread? Yeah, so that's um, where basically having more flowers in the landscape just provides more resources for everyone, right? And so, um, so having this diversity of flowers will will increase the um, abundant, you know, the availability of resources, and then also decrease competition because they tend to go to different kinds of plants. And honeybees especially like sort of mass blooming things, right? So, so having um, having a couple of those mass blooming things can be really good for them. So. Um... Varroa, you mentioned a lot in their guides on your websites. There's guides or integrated management programs of varroa. Yes, yeah. So, so for honeybees, they have um, these varroa mites, which uh, which originally evolved with um, the honeybees in Asia, and then they moved over into our European honeybees. And uh, and and study after study has shown that if you don't control your varroa mite populations, um, then you have higher winter losses, right? And so it's really important to, to control those. And, and there's a number of different ways you can do this. So you can get stocks of bees that have more natural resistance to varroa, like they'll, um, they have hygienic behavior where they pull out uh, pupa that have varroa on it and throw it away so they can smell that and remove it. They will uh, groom the varroa off of each other. So again, reduce populations that way. Uh, so having those genetic stocks is, is one possibility. Um, other things are these sort of physical uh, management. So if you break the brood cycle and the row will have no um, nothing to, to grow on and so they, they don't increase their populations. Um, and, uh, and then there's again, these sort of soft chemicals that you can use like oxalic acid and then the harder things. And so uh, Robin Underwood and Margarita Lopez Arribi wrote uh, extension note on managing Varroa that is available through our website. So I encourage people to read that. Right, so are there any state agencies that are um, supporting pollinator gardens and the like? Places people yes. need to help? Yep. So, um, so, so in terms of, you know, home gardens, um, you know, this is something that through the Master Gardeners Pollinator Garden Certification Program, you can learn how to, to develop that, but also for, um, for growers and then for, um, 
if you have sort of larger tracts of land, then you can use, let me see, I have this information. So there is, um, there is the uh, Conservation Stewardship Program, which is run through the NRCS, and then also the uh, um, EQUIP Program, which is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, um, which is also through NRCS. And so they provide support uh, for people to convert parts of their land into, into pollinator habitat. And PennDOT also has a, um, an, an Adopt and Beautify program. So if you're interested in, in creating pollinator habitat along your local um, road systems, and that program is also something that can help you. Um, and then I, I think there should be some links. Oh, yeah. So Mary put those links into, into the chat. There's also, um, you can find through uh, the Xerces Society um, some um, uh, instruction sheets for how to develop a pollinator habitat, particularly in farmland. So one of our guests is uh, coming from Ohio and wants to know if the recommendation for plants in Pennsylvania would also be good in Ohio. Um, for, for the most part, yes. They're, I mean, they, they, they will be very similar um, and, and should, be, should be fine to use. Um, but I, I would also recommend checking with your Ohio State Master Gardener program as well, just to see if they have any sort of specific recommendations. But for the most part, um, our plants also work fine in, in Ohio and New York and Connecticut and, and so forth. So another question is honeybees. They thought that honeybees were a pollen faithful. Therefore, um, if they were on apple to apple and not apple to pear. Oh, well, there's a lot of debate about that. So again, so so honeybees will kind of um, they they do like to go to sort of the mass blooming resources, and if they find something, then they will recruit to that. Um, and but I will say that you know when we look at our honeybee loads, um, there's a lot of different kinds of pollen in in each individual load. And and when people have like David Bittinger have done studies more on the um, the solitary bees that are in in the apple orchards, they find that they they routinely are flying outside of the apple orchards and going to other other plants. So so they are, you know, like like us, they also would like to have diverse diets and so they mix um, from around around the landscape. Right. Um, if you find a swarm of bees, um, should you leave the honeybee queen on her own or should you find a beekeeper to collect them? So um, this is swarming season, right? So this is when uh, the honeybee colonies are bringing a lot of resources from those spring flowering trees and, and shrubs. And so they build up their populations and they, um, they split their colonies. So the old queen uh, and, and about um, a third to half of the workers will leave the colony. And then um, the, the workers that are remaining will rear a new queen. But the, the swarm that leaves, they go and, and sit on a branch or any sort of, you know, we've had at one point during a tailgating, we had a swarm of our bees went and landed inside somebody's open car window and hung out there for a while. Um, so they'll go and, and, and form um, this cluster and then send out scouts to look for new places to live. So uh, and the, how they do that is really awesome. And I probably don't have time to talk about it, but it's really neat. Um, Tom Seeley wrote a book called Honeybee Democracy that describes it, which is super fun to read. But, um, but when they're in that, that cluster, they'll send out scouts and look for a new place. And they'll usually relocate within you know, one to three days. So um, they're only there for a short period of time and then they've moved on. So you don't need to try to contact a local beekeeper to collect that swarm, but often local beekeepers are very happy to do that because now they've got a free colony that um, is usually pretty healthy. And one of our listeners has pointed out that DCNR in some areas has a launch of pollinator program that might people. Yes. Might be able to Ooh, did, they, did they put the link to that? I had actually been trying to find that for this talk and I wasn't able to find it. So if, if Justin, if you have it, you could pop it in there and uh, bring a little light on it for Christina. Look, awesome. Christina, this is a fabulous, you've done a fabulous sim, uh, talk and fielding all these questions and so forth. And I think people will have, I quickly appreciate your absolute enthusiasm and fascination with bees and everything about bees. So thanks again for this great College Connections. Thanks. I just want to, we better wrap things up here. I just want to encourage people that up next week, up next month rather in June, we'll be hosting uh, Majid Falad, Beth Gugino and Kevin Hockett to learn more about conventional and modern breeding techniques, microbial disease management 
and how to keep your tomatoes healthy and delicious. So check the, our website for that. And um, with that, I hope you've really enjoyed this as much as I have. Congratulations again to Christina for a great job. And um, look for, we all look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Rash. Thanks, everyone.